Hello, and welcome to IRI Growth Insights, featuring IRI thought leaders, industry partners, and guests. For more than 40 years, IRI has been known for its invaluable data, but these podcasts delve into the insights the data reveal to fuel market disruption and market growth for those in the CPG, retail, healthcare, and media markets. I'm your host, Joan Driggs, coming to you from IRI's corporate headquarters in Chicago. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Fresh Pulse. I'm going to just say Fresh Pulse podcast. I know it's part of the IRI Growth Insights, but since we merged with NPD, we're going to be changing the name. So, hey, there's a teaser. Anyway, um, I am so excited to be joined again by my colleague, Jenna Parker, our fresh expert as principal of IRI's Fresh Center of Excellence, and our valued IRI partner, Anna Marie Rohrink, president of 210 Analytics, a research company that specializes in food retailing. Um, ladies, it's been a little while since we've been together. I just want to start out by saying that 2022 really ended on a challenging note for us. Um, we have very high inflation. Supply chain has recovered a, a good bit. There's some gaps for sure. Um, At-home consumption is higher, so I guess that's a high note. Um, in fact, we know that that's going to continue because well more than 50% of workers report that they will be working from home at least part of the time, which is very encouraging. Still, Anna Marie, I want to start with you. What do we have? What does the 2023 outlook look like? You know, I wish there were um, one simple word. Um, I often get asked this question and people expect me to say, well, great, good, not so good, et cetera. Um, I think the first words that come to mind is it depends. Uh, it depends whether you look at dollars or units. It depends whether you compared a year ago or versus 2019 baseline. It depends on what sector of the store you're looking at. We still see strength in Delhi prepared, et cetera. Uh, but more than anything, uh, consumers just have put the foot on the brake in terms of spending um, as it relates to groceries and restaurants. Um, so it's no longer that switch of, oh, we're eating at home more um, so we can spend and premiumize our purchases there because we're not eating at restaurants. It's really a lot of pressure on units and volume throughout the entire store. And so I think to win in 2023, we're going to have to pull out all the stops in terms of enticing people to purchase and enabling people to purchase. That's a whole other thing. Um, so I think, first of all, it comes down to promotional creativity. Uh, we still are not in the position oftentimes to promote as deeply as we had in the past. We still don't have the opportunity to promote as widely as we have. So what can we do in terms of just a couple of days or a mix and match that takes a little bit of the pressure off of one particular protein or produce item, or what have you? Um, the second one in my mind is operational excellence. So when people are in the store with the intent to buy something, we have to have it in stock so that we don't lose that purchase. Um, people still react very strongly to a clean and neat store. So even though we're still having labor issues, that cleanliness of the store, the organization of the store continues to be very important. Um, same under operational excellence is the whole idea of good customer service. You know, that's one of the hardest things to do when you're suffering from labor shortages. And then the third area I would say is just continue to be that that helping hand. And I say just like this is easy, but be in the helping hand with consumers continuing to have to balance health, time, and money. And that money, as you indicate, is getting harder and harder. There just is tremendous inflationary pressure on that dollar. And that means that uh, we still have all the pressure on time. We still have to balance uh, running around like chickens with our head cuts off while we don't have as money, as much money as we used to. So. It's a complex world, and the more we can um, be part of that world and be a helping hand instead of just a purveyor of goods, I think that those are some of the winning areas for 2023. You know, my motto is make the shopper the hero. So it, it to me, you're making a shopper the hero in different ways than I would normally think about. You know, I, I think of it as the shopper feeling heroic by making the right choices and stuff, but 
and that this is definitely part of it because it's hard to make some of these choices when you're balancing, as you said, the health, time, and money. So Jana, what does this look like for you? What is your 2023 outlook? So much of what Anne-Marie said, I completely agree with. I think the thing that we have to anchor ourselves in after two years of disruption, there's also been two years of tremendous opportunity because things that we, the three of us have been talking about for decades in this industry, which is about understanding truly the differences of the consumer. And I agree with you about the hero, but I also think it's about being the consumer's partner. They look to retailers now more than ever to be their partner, their educator, their solver. And I think there's been many other areas outside of the grocery industry that have created that trusted advisor and curated, almost like respected and curated um, trust that a consumer has in a retailer. And I'm using air quotes for those that on video, because we're used to now the things in our pocket, the supercomputers in our pocket, having the answers and connecting us with partners that can solve our needs. And so what I think as we enter into 2023, the difference maker will be companies that have looked at this disruption and recognized what, how they can stand out from the crowd. And I think the ways they can stand out are being more educational, solution-oriented. And again, Anne-Marie says, not easy, right? But we've chased a lot of things that at the heart of it were solutions. So for example, we get a lot of questions about plant-based. If it's core, plant-based was a trusted brand and a relevant package that met someone's needs. And when it stopped maybe not meeting their needs in taste, quality, or other value dimensions for them, it wasn't about the plant-based, it was about the need solving. I think similarly, we also learned through the meal kit phenomenon that there's a lot of folks who want to upskill or get into ending up with a meal and a grocery store sells you ingredients, right? So both plant-based and kits, I get questions a lot. How big are they today? How big are they going to be? And what I always say is here's the numbers because we have it at IRI, but get to the heart of what that solved. And I think the difference maker will be people who can stand out by being solution oriented. I think the other thing that we learned is going to make a difference is getting into who they, being the consumer that you're partnering with, are. Whether it's regionality, age, original ethnicity, taste palettes, and frankly, I really think there's going to be a lot of work this year and talk of how involved do you want to be in making the meal or making your solution, right? Because we have Epicurean curious people shopping in our stores, buying our foods, and we have people who frankly just want it to show up, right? And understanding that difference, what part of that continuum of consumers do you want to be a part of? That leads me to my last difference maker, which is the reality of channel shifting in fresh. Every month when I do our updates for IRI and now NPD and our new company, the number one thing I call attention to is how much share of the omni-channel and all outlet marketplace in fresh foods, meat, deli, bakery, produce, you know, dairy, right? Where grocery has always been the mainstay. As of the end of 2022, traditional grocers, so supermarkets who sell a little bit of everything and don't specialize in it, discount or health and wellness, they're not a mass super and they're not a club. Traditional grocers, based on our IRI panel data, are less than 40% of all fresh food sales in this country. And just two years ago, that was three points higher, between two and three points higher, depending on the department. So channel shifting is real. And why that becomes a difference maker is supermarkets have always solved all needs for all people all the time. And I really think that we've got to get focused on who, how, and what in those solutions. And you just said supermarkets have always solved the needs. But is it because the competition has gotten so much stiffer in people or different retailers kind of carving out what they represent, what they stand for, that it's gotten more challenging to rise above? I mean, dig into that a little bit for me to talk about what is what has caused that erosion of fresh purchases at traditional grocery. 
When you stand for everything, sometimes you stand for nothing. And I think that's never more true than in 2022, because again, what's been exciting for me as I've been a part of now our broader community outside of retail. So we have partners now at MPD who look at apparel, sporting goods, books, right? All these other things that people buy and all of those channels, as I said, them or all those needs that you have as a consumer you probably know exactly where you prefer to buy those things. And by the way, a lot of those things now, whether you're buying or you're educating yourself, it's happening outside of a brick and mortar store. In food retail and grocery, we've always just relied on people are gonna walk up and down the aisles, <laughs> right? And, and they're gonna, you know, we're gonna just give them products, they'll figure out what to do with them. But I think what we're seeing is where we're seeing the growth and channel shifting the most in fresh is in club and mass super. And when I have that conversation with our industry, the immediate response is, oh, but why are people buying avocados there? Or why are they buying meat there? They have to buy so much or it's not the quality I have, but it's situationally relevant this year with inflation. If you were looking to save money on everything from motor oil to laundry detergent to toilet paper, where'd you go? Probably to a club store or a super center. While you're there, the investments that were made by people like Costco, Sam's, Walmart, Trader Joe's, by the way, on being differentiated and relevant made more sense to that consumer in that moment than driving across town to get the better three avocados from a grocer. So I'd love to hear your take on this, Anna Marie, because it's been a huge topic for us socially. And I know you've talked with a lot of retailers. Your points on um, the stores themselves driving their own success is, is extremely important. But I think there is a different undercurrent as well, because for more than 10 years, we've been reporting on the fact that millennials have under-indexed for conventional supermarkets for a long time. And they've always loved super centers and club. And so as we're starting to see the majority dollar shift away from boomers towards younger generations, we're now seeing that actually coming out into spending numbers. And that's part of the reason why it's moving towards uh, those formats as well. And another underlining reason of that is having done quite a bit of research in frozen and freezing in recent years, um, we see that younger generations rely way more on frozen, but also on freezing themselves. And so where I think, again, people have driven their own success is in the fact that they have created packaging that is freezer ready. They have created uh, packaging, what we call saddle packs in the industry, where you can buy three pounds of ground beef, but they come in one pound increments. So people are very easy to buy these big quantities at, to your point, the Costco's and Walmarts of this world, get the discount, but still not have to reportion anything themselves at home. So I think it's a combination of societal and demographic shifts right along with some companies haven't done really well in driving their own success. But Anna Marie, I want to go back to some of those three things that you talked about, you know, um, the promotional creativity. Um, how does that look to be playing out because we haven't seen promotions rebound. We we're seeing more frequency, but frankly, the depth hasn't been there. And especially as inflation is kind of softening a bit, people are getting frustrated with that. So what do we have to do to get some of these retailers and manufacturers to be a little bit more strategic with promotions? Yeah, you know, well, first of all, I know IRI has some amazing tools in that, and I would definitely recommend everybody talk about that because there are so many different ways in which you can test whether a promotion works, what, what might be the best message, et cetera. The other thing I want to point out, again, having been the grocery data geek here for, for more than almost 20 years, um, we have seen that it used to be all about the paper ad. People would sit around the kitchen table with a bunch of ads from a different store, plan their meals, et cetera. Well, that paper ad now is only researched by about 35% of people, most of whom are boomers, and more and more retailers are getting rid of it, turning off zip codes, turning down the frequency because of the cost of paper, because of uh, being very hard to continue to distribute it with all the small town papers being out of uh, commission. But that means that people have to engage with these digital sources. And not everybody is. So we're not seeing the same kind of uptake from digital circulars or digital coupons 
And so what I am seeing here in recent months as I've been doing store tours is many more retailers and in-store signage that says, download this digital coupon with the QR code right there saying, use your smart phone, the phone to download this digital coupon that gives you another dollar off or use your phone to get the digital circular to get coupons, to get discounts. So again, this is an, I think an area where we need to drive our own success and get people to realize that they have to be on their apps on digital coupons and use the digital circular but, you know, anytime something isn't in their face, <laughs> you know, it's harder. So that means we have to work harder and uh, really set people up for their own success, to your point, being their own heroes, right? But we need to help them with that. But I think to that point, spinning it, you know, I'm the optimist here, I guess, and I always have been. When you've had someone download the coupon, why not also give them the option to learn more about that product? And that's where we as fresh foods marketers are falling behind our CPG brethren. Many aisle, many in aisle big CPG products have really learned the power of the product description, image, and even utilizing further click through to tell their story. So I actually think the digital could be our great equalizer because one of the benefits, whether it's in-store coupons, so you know that person's opted in to want to buy your product, so they're taking that minute to click on that, to add that to their cart, half of them or more might also take that minute to learn more about that product and make the decision. There's so many things within Fresh we struggle with educating the consumer on, whether it's the benefits of vertical farming, the taste palettes of various apples or oranges, we could use digital to do that in such a way we're not doing today. Looked into that a lot. And so when you click on a lot of websites, whether you're talking apples or you're talking steak, what have you, um, you know, if you walk around in the produce department, you see signs showing which apples are good for baking, which are good for snacking. If you walk, walk around the meat department, it will often have, you know, what, how is a ribeye different from a porterhouse, from a filet mignon, from a New York strip. Uh, but you go online and you click on description and it's either blank or it has the UPC or it says steak. And I was going <laughs> to so, say, what stores are you shopping at? Because here yeah. I've seen those in the pictures when you and I create a test and learn or we talk. And then I go shopping and I stand at that meat case and I go, what? <laughs> so, yes, if the signage is up and if it's relevant. So anyway, Joan, sorry. Well, well, you know, when you both talk about digital, I am going back to those younger shoppers again. So maybe it's the promotional stuff that is it being directed to those younger shoppers? I mean, they're the ones who are more more likely to adopt their smartphones as their, you know, their access to coupons and discounts. Well, we haven't even talked about, we just talked about coupons and discounts. And I do think many of the high, low grocers, which is the biggest difference in traditional grocery, let's be honest, whether it's circular, app, in-store signage. Traditional retailers do have promotional and trade strategies versus an EDLP strategy at a club or a super center. But you hit on something, Joan, about younger people. 80% of influence, this is a study from last year we did at IRI, but something like 80 to 90% of product decisions have been influenced by something digital among consumers under age 40. And I wonder what's happening with the other 10%. It's probably, you know, talking with friends or reading it somewhere out. But where I'm going with that is the other piece, in addition to having better detail when someone is in the store and they want to opt into the digital, what about the before the store? I've been fortunate now that the world is more open to have been part of some really fantastic brainstorms with some of our retail and supplier partners, but some of the challenges they're reality and facing. For example, in baked goods, we've seen some truly interesting perfectly relevant, designed for a consumer who is not engaged with the in-store bakery today, come through the data or be part of an ideation session. But I've also been a part of in the bakery industry, those products hitting shelf. And because that consumer doesn't shop the in-store bakery on every trip, has no idea there. And then the product dies on the vine. We've seen some really cool things with in-store merchandising around solving the meal at some of our traditional grocer partners. How you communicate outside the store is as vital as when you're in. And when it comes to, you know, we're getting ready for our next Top Trends and Fresh series, it'll 
go live on 228, but Sally Lyons Wyatt and I were talking last night about the need for affordable essentials to drive into the store. So how are you using outside of the store to promote that you've got everyday low prices on those affordable essentials that are in the most baskets? That's really where traditional grocery is losing. But if you get someone in on the affordable essential, like ground beef at a great price point or something else, how are you also educating them on those escapes in the bakery, in the deli, in the meat produce combination merchandising. And I think we should be on social media to do that. I mean, literally later today, we're presenting IRI growth leaders and a major meat company made the growth leader list this year, the CBG growth leader list this year, because they blew up as a TikTok trend, right? In some of their product lines. Wow. The influence of social media to design in to get people into the store has to be embraced better. And what's also awesome about social media, another IRI plug, but it's one that truly excites me. We can use known purchase behavior data to serve ads so you're not wasting those dollars. I just had an important client who's getting into a great social media campaign this year because I know a lot of companies are starting to do their consumer marketing again. And the fatal flaw was their agency was like, let's send this to all the primary grocery shoppers. I know that that protein only has 45% everyday household penetration. Why would we send it to all the primary grocery shoppers? That digital out of store advertising with targeted audiences is really going to be the key because we don't have to have a Super Bowl ad to get that to impact our sales. No. And, you know, for new product pay setters, which we're really in the midst of, it is all about there is no one product for all people anymore. You know, so to your point, even 45% of trial or repeat is really healthy. So you're right, go to those people who really matter. Um, Anna Marie, give us, you know, you you mentioned your three things up at the front of our of our conversation here. What are some next steps? Like give me in closing just one or two action items that you think that any retailer or manufacturer should be taking to show support for that shopper. Well, I think we've talked quite a bit about uh, promotions and to your point, they've not come quite back, but I, I would love to see more creativity, whether that is a one day promotion, a three day promotion, a mix and max. I saw at hy V some beautiful mix and match promotions, combining produce with carbs, with meat. And so it was those three, pick any three items for a certain amount. Um, so make it easy on people. I love your theme of of make the shopper the hero and anything we can do in that. Particularly lacking for time comes out in all aspects of the grocery um, trip. And it's not just cooking, right? We often think about value added or fully cooked or those kinds of things or, or deli prepared. In reality, people struggle with what's for dinner. I just did 25 consumer interviews and, and, you know, one lady said, look, I'm a busy mom. Sometimes I have five minutes to cook. Other times I have 25 minutes to cook, indicating that the 25 minutes was like, oh, look at me. I have all the time <laughs> of my life. And then I, I was looking through some old pictures and this retailer said, quick meals cooks in under 45 minutes. And it's like, okay, yeah, 45 minutes, that's my Sunday family dinner. Folks. <laughs> so, you know, relevance, I, I would say, you know, truly try to understand what is going on in the mind of these people. You know, we've talked about inflation, but it is really the triple whammy of, we still want to do good by ourselves, whether that's emotional well-being or physical health. It is, managing our budget. Um, and it's also just staying sane on all things time front. Love that. Jana, how about you? Final thoughts? I really think five years from now, we'll look back at the beginning of this decade and know that the people who learned from these last three years, not just on the highest price threshold and, and how to make sure that you've got you know a robust supply chain, which are extremely important and I cannot underestimate, but all, I think five years from now, I'll be talking about companies and retailers that today would seem out of this world to us. And I think 10 and 20 years from now, those kids who are, you know, we're thinking of a Gen Zs will be in their 40s and, you know, 50s. And, and they'll be laughing at this world where we used to not, where we still had a paper circular and we made people go up and down the aisles. But it's this moment. It's this year where those who learned and are breaking apart from the pack will have their acceleration. And those who still ask more of the, well, I can't alienate my base, 
will probably have a very tough time to grow in the years ahead and certainly 20 years from now. I love that. And that is, um, I think that that is a very powerful message, you know, that now is the moment for breaking out of the pack and forging your own path, but knowing who your desired consumers are, who, you know, and how you're be going to be able to help them. Because I did, I just want to go back and reiterate a couple of the things that you both mentioned about promotional creativity, like do not take your foot off the gas of operational excellence, especially in this tough time of labor shortages and high inflation and all the things that we're grappling with. Um, you both really spoke so well of being that shopper's partner in things health, in things solution, um, as always. But Jana, you mentioned this too, even in solving needs, you know, when you stand for everything, you stand for nothing. So again, I'm going to just finish up with your, your encouragement of taking this moment to really find your own new path that's going to resonate with shoppers. It's a huge challenge. It's groceries always been a difficult business, um, but now is the time for an injection of some really new thinking. So with that, I want to thank you both and I'll look forward to catching up with you soon. Thanks so much, Joan. It's been fun. Thank you for listening. Please become a subscriber and let us know what you want to learn more about. We'll serve it up in a future IRI Growth Insights episode. Look for us wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to review IRI Growth Insights. Also, visit us on the web at iriworldwide.com and connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn.